this was a 62 block area that had been forgotten by the city of Dallas. What did it look like? It was like a war zone. For years, it was called the DMZ, the dividing line between something that was better and something that was worse. It had no name, very impoverished, African-American and Hispanic families. There were uh, prostitutes, very high crime area. Syringe needles, drugs dealing in this uh, particular area. There was nothing there except residents who were just barely hanging on. It was an opportunity to partner with others and indeed go into a community that was ready to be transformed. It was started some 12 years ago in lieu of an anniversary where we would do something for ourselves some new statue or some new plaque or some new bell tower. Uh, we would do something in outreach, something for other people. St. Michael and All Angels has been a very large Episcopal congregation for many years. We're 7,200 members now. And for decades, we've been one of the largest parishes in the Episcopal Church. And so because of the size, but also because of vast resources, um, much is expected of us, and our congregation feels that. Uh, that we have the possibility that here in the Park Cities, that's uh, aff affectionately called the bubble in Dallas, that we would break out of the bubble and not just live our own easy life here in the Park Cities, but that we would see ourselves as participating in the larger metro area of Dallas. My predecessor and the people of this church put together the strength and the will of this congregation to take on this massive partnership. It's as big as a city, uh, the Jubilee Park neighborhood. From the beginning, we were very naive and didn't understand what it was truly going to take to make this project go forward. And we've learned a lot within the, the past 13 years about all of that. And we've learned that really from the residents in the community. And so we uh, put around boxes all throughout the, uh, the church to uh, get ideas and suggestions from people because we wanted it to come from the bottom up. It was obvious from the reports that we got back from the boxes that had been stationed out in the parish that we wanted to do something for the community, a community in Dallas, and we wanted it to, to be centered around children. Well, we looked at a lot of different ideas, and we had an opportunity with Habitat for Humanity uh, to partner with them. They were building quite a few houses in that neighborhood, but there were two long, skinny, adjacent blocks, and it was thought that two adjacent homes could be built by the parish that would house a project, an after-school program for the community. We identified this area out here, a 62-block area, that is um, a, a, foreign, a foreign mission field, but one that is only about 15 minutes from our church, our parish. It, it officially resides totally uh, southwest of uh, Highway 30, which for years was called the DMZ, the dividing line between something that was better and something that was worse, which was Jubilee. It, it was just a neglected area, um, even just basic things like sidewalks, uh, having our police to patrol our area, even street lights, you know, just several infrastructure things that you would think a neighborhood would have was being neglected and children in our program, you know, just needed a safe place to be. The, the freeways had isolated it from the rest of the world, so there was no industry there. When the Ford Motor Plant ended its life about 10 blocks away uh, in the early 50s, this neighborhood went in decline, and it stayed in decline for the next five decades. We had an opportunity to meet Holt Lunsford who actually purchased the plant and one of the things that he took note of is that when they purchased the plant they actually got access to aerial photos of the Ford plant specifically when the quitting bell sounded and he said it was kind of almost surreal to watch how many people were actually walking back into the community because they walked to work every single day. When the Ford plant closed 
there wasn't any plants around, so the community members actually had to move out of our community. And that was the start point to having the community change dramatically. So we thought this was an outstanding opportunity to move into an area where no one paid any attention to it. It really is a reciprocal operation because we provide and have provided a lot for this area out here, but they have provided a lot of opportunity for us to develop a, a sense of missionary work in our own backyard. Why in this country, after spending hundreds of billions of dollars at the federal, state, and local level, why are our inner cities in such bad shape? And so the concept here is to take a different approach, and that is to adopt an entire 62 block area and use that as a microcosm and address each of the main factors that create vitality in a community. Housing, education, public safety, public and private health, economic development, employment, community ownership. Those elements are so necessary because they're all interrelated. So we started, and you're standing right here on the first substantive thing that we tried to do, and that is build a park. When I'd come over here, sometimes every day, right on Congo Street, which is the narrowest street in Dallas, every time I'd drive by there, there were two African-American young men sitting on the uh, front porch dribbling a basketball. So one day I stopped, rolled down the window and said, hey guys, why aren't you all playing basketball? And I said, well, there is no place to play except the high school and that's five miles away. And so that was the germ. Back in the very early stages when Walt and the group were trying to decide what the long range strategy for Jubilee was, we had a need for increased early childhood education. We were operating here after school, and yet we had two elementary public education schools here, about 800 to 900 students, all at the lower tier of performance. So one of the early things that we did was to decide to put a Head Start facility in Jubilee Park. And that process took probably three years. We finally opened David's Place in 2002. Davis Place is an early childhood development center for three to five year olds. We have 171 children here. We have 19 children per classroom. The children from this neighborhood, a lot of the families are poor. We have a lot of single parents and uh, we deal with a lot of issues um, with our families, such as drug abuse, domestic violence. Uh, we have some grandparents that are raising children. Before Davis Place came, we didn't have a place that served the needs of children to prepare them to transition into kindergarten. A lot of our kids, unfortunately, because of the homes that they come from, haven't been exposed to a lot of literacy. So sometimes our kids come in already two years behind. A lot of times, the times that the kids spend here are the most important time of the child's day. You know, some of our kids come in hungry. Some of them come in with the same clothes on. There's a lot of neglect. The children that have left here, where we were able to help the parents to become better parents and become advocates for their children have been very successful in public school. I've been here in Jubilee Park 12 years. Head start goes a long way in my life. My husband and I have six children, um, and I would, all of our children went to Head Start, uh, Greater Dallas. And the baby boy is 17 years old now, and he's about to graduate next year. And so all of our kids will have then graduated from high school and on to uh, college. Going through Head Start with, with uh, our children uh, helped me to be a better parent in uh, being able to go to the school district and uh, be an advocate for my kids when it comes to them going to public school. It also helped with uh, us teaching them how to eat nutritiously. And then in turn, it helped me to feed the rest of the family and it, how important it is for families to be together, especially at mealtime. And so Head Start has played a very huge role in my life with, uh, with our children. So. Actually, just this weekend, we had a parent that was with us about six years ago that was killed in a domestic violence um, accident. 
And she was only 15 when she was here, so she actually gave birth to him when she was about 12 or 13. And I remember her because um, her child came to school with um, some crack cocaine residue in his pocket. And I just thought about, you know, how hard it was for her because her mother, I think, was a drug abuser. And she really didn't have a fair chance at it. We hear stories like that more times than what we would like. But those are the kind of things that we're dealing with here. Some of the children that come to Davis Place, we've got to get them settled emotionally before we can teach them because they've been exposed to so much already. All children have potential. They might just need to have someone there to um, just to help them along, along the way. But at the end of the day, or at the end of a school year, when a child transitions into public school and they come back with a good report card, you know, or a family that becomes self-sufficient, that's very rewarding. The elementary school at that time was the second lowest school in DISD. Owen Roberts had had five different principals in the five previous years, so no continuity at all. I went to the school board and said, we would like to form a partnership with you, and if we did that, would you get the very best principal and leave her over there for at least five years, and that's what they did, Zulima Ortiz. I came on board in 2001 and quickly learned that this was a, a very close-knit community that we're all working towards a better uh, schooling, educational program, so that our children could have a better future. And so uh, in the nine years, we've uh, developed a partnership through tutoring. Uh, also, uh, the after-school program at Jubilee provides our students some um, homework assistance. Our students enjoy the, the meals that the Kids Cafe provides for them. And so that partnership has grown in those nine years. And I feel that the academic growth that our students have been able to make have been uh, because of the partnership. It was exemplary, really as of last spring, and we are most excited about that. After a 10-year period that uh, Owen Roberts was able to come from the very bottom to the top. Hi, Miss Di. How are you? <laughs> this is actually the church. Um, Jubilee purchased this church a couple of years ago. Uh, right after we paid for it, we realized that we needed it. We were going to tear it down and use it for one of the buildings, but we needed the building for additional programming space. And so now the church is kind of a multi-purpose room for us, but we still lovingly call it the church, and I think we'll always call it the church. We have our second grade through fifth graders that are meeting in here Monday through Thursday, and they come in and get a hot meal. And then they do cultural enrichment in the afternoon. Amidst all this chaos, as much organization. I started with Jubilee Center uh, at its inception. Uh, back in the fall of 1997, I actually started as, a, as an AmeriCorps member. We, we basically just moved into this community to get to know the families here and to start up our after school program. One of the things I think that's, that makes it unique is the support that we've received from St. Michael's. You know, the people that volunteer here and support Jubilee Center, it's genuine. It's a real feeling. It's not like somebody just coming down here, patting you on the back, giving you a handout, and going on about their way. It's, it's a real genuine concern and a hope to that the people in this community really have an opportunity to, to live a better life, a quality life. So it's meant a lot to me because I can relate to some of the kids. I mean, I, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I understand, um, you know, where they come from when when they want to have things, when they want to go places, when they need help uh, with homework. And uh, I mean, God, some of these kids call me at two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they'll say, "Can hey, can I just hang out with you for a little while? I need to get away. And I know how that feels because a lot of times I used to be stuck in my community, you know, not having anybody to come and get you and take you somewhere and just simple things like to the mall. You know, I didn't do that when I was growing up. So it makes me feel good to know that I can just come and get a kid and take them to the mall and get them out the neighborhood. Okay. 
when I met Diana, she was in the third grade and found out that her mom was incarcerated and she was being raised by her dad. And Jubilee meant the world to her. I mean, she's one kid that was always at Jubilee, never missed coming here, never missed a meal, you know, always on the field trip. She was actually one of the kids that I would take to the beauty salon with me and do her hair. You know, I'm glad that she was able to look at me as that person that she could talk to. I, I was kind of like that mother figure in her life because she didn't have that for a long time. She didn't have that. Her mom was gone and was going to be gone for a while. And so I was just happy to um, have that relationship with her. She went to beauty school. <laughs> she just recently, you know, finished beauty school and getting ready to go get her license. So to me, I feel like she looked up to me as a role model. And, uh, she's here working at Jubilee City just like me. And so that's just a special relationship that I have with her. This is the very first time that we've sold fruits and vegetables, so uh, we listened to the community, they said, we want access to nutrition, and the most important nutrition we want is fruits and vegetables. The issue is, an area like this in Dallas is called a food desert, um, and these are all over the country. There are areas of major urban communities where there's no access to supermarkets. Um, so in this community, the closest supermarket is several miles away. Um, and women will have to walk two miles uh, to a grocery store to pay higher prices for lower quality food. And by doing that, you don't want to buy fresh fruits and vegetables because they're going to go bad. So we're trying to work together with them to say, how can we make them right in your backyard so that you don't have to walk two miles away to get those things? I mean, to get that many people generated by the community, the women that organized that decided who was in operations and who was in finance and who was in marketing, and probably had never done anything like that in their life. And, and they were successful. At a dollar a package, $460 in revenue, says we sold a lot of vegetables, and not to make money per se, but to provide the community with something that they sorely need. People ask the question whether folks in urban areas want to eat fruits and vegetables. Uh, the last time that we did this, we sold $300 worth of fruits and vegetables. And today we brought in $400 worth. And every time we're going up and people are buying more and more fruits and vegetables. We've had a couple of women come to us a couple of years ago and said that they wanted an exercise class and they wanted to take personal responsibility for their own health and they organized an exercise class and it started out kind of small and then before long they realized that they needed two exercise classes. One wanted just mixed aerobics and the other wanted one of this new phenomenon called Zumba. We have instructors that come and they teach for free. Twenty-seven women that come to these to both classes that stay very active and in fact one of our women that's involved in the exercise class has lost over 100 pounds and so everything is self-taught and self-led so when she talks about what she did in order to lose weight she talks about her own personal story you good? I can't complain. You good? Good? In the early days when I came in July, August and September all I did was walk around and people would walk up to me and say father where is your church? And I would say, Jubilee is my church. And they say, oh, Jubilee Center is your church? Oh, no, no. These 62 blocks are my church. I am your chaplain. You are my parishioner. And over time, people warmed up to that idea. And I think a real breakthrough moment was at the Christmas dinner that we had for senior citizens. I had any number of people come up and say, will you pray for me? Will you visit my father in the hospital? Will you visit my sister? Can you add my cousin to your prayer list? That is when the connection was made. See, when I came up, I had to walk to school three miles, and I had to, when I get there, I had to have iron heater. We had to go down in the wood and talk to him and make a fire. All that you had to do. All that we had to do. And, this, and they listen. Here St. Michael comes in, not planning a church, begins the community revitalization, has programs for the youth at Episcopal camps, and then brings in a chaplain sometime later uh, to do services. So it's a different way. 
And even though I work with people of different ethnicities, of different socioeconomic uh, status, I'm finding that people are hurting, that people are in need of healing, and that people are in search of a savior. And even though there is a language barrier, uh, there may be a history barrier, economic, ethnic barrier, the condition is the same. So Jubilee definitely is a light, not only uh, in this part of Dallas, but for the city of Dallas. And it shows how ministry can be done, and it shows how transformation is possible. You meet some of the people who live in this neighborhood, you see the needs that, that are in this neighborhood, and it's just the kind of thing that the church calls you to do. I'm the uh, former chairman of the Housing Task Force here at Jubilee, charged with the responsibility of building affordable housing in this 62 block area that, that we call the Jubilee neighborhood. We hired Antonio DeMombro in Boston to develop a master plan for the community. And that's what this document is. It's a long-term view of how Jubilee can be developed, focusing primarily on affordable housing. And so we use this document, which Antonio basically developed with input from the community. We didn't want to come in here and just try to massively redevelop the neighborhood. We didn't want to gentrify the neighborhood. We wanted the people who live here now to be able to afford to continue to live here. We built six or seven houses here already. We could build another 15 to 20 houses in this neighborhood, and we continue to look for land. So we realized that in, in neighborhoods like this, people don't have a lot of disposable income to put large down payments down. So part of the money that we raise, we assist them with a the down payment. We are building workforce housing, though, which means that the buyer needs to have a job. They need to be able to service some form of mortgage. There's a qualification process that they have to go through, just like any other home buyer. One of our first houses that we built and sold was to a woman, a single mother, who just lost her husband to cancer. And she teaches at the local HUD Head Start School. That, that makes you feel really good. <laughs> This building over here is our brand new community center. We actually were very fortunate. We got a very generous grant from T. Moon Pickens in order for us to build a new community center as well as a resource center. What we asked was, could we take a little bit more time and actually engage the people that live in the neighborhood and get their thoughts and opinions? So where the building should go, for example, and where it sits today is a direct result of those dialogues. Um, what I think is so important to note here is that as a client, in my case, Jubilee Park, the community center, that group of leaders was willing to say, let's do that. And that's a risk. And actually a building that started off to be twice as big is actually much smaller because the staff and their involvement and really thinking about how to use the building rather than just, you know, a series of boxes where you, you know, you have to do things. The residents were really clear that they didn't want the car to be so close to the building. But if you live here, you're going to walk to this facility. So why have a parking lot or why have a drive right at the front door? So if you look at the building, at that doorway, it's a, it's a glass entry and on the other side there's another set of glass doors that go to the park. So I think kind of the heart of this whole project, which is that green space, which is such a luxury that we often sometimes take for granted in a lot of communities and in a community like this to have that, just that open space where you could gather, you can play and celebrate life, death. I mean it's it's an asset that will last for generations beyond the building. As an architect, I was just in awe of this street. Now, it's tired, it's very tired. But if you think about it beyond the surface, it's an amazing place. It's beautiful and it's the way, it's sort of the framework that it creates. And it's, it just speaks to community. So as an architect, you know, I wanted to go in a house. And so I just finally got up enough guts and I said, Frankie, can I, can, can I see in your house? And she, you know, she tells the story better. She's like, who is this man that wants to come in my house? And I'll never forget, because we walked back and, and I went in her house and she'd been doing her laundry and like laundry's hanging everywhere, drying in the house. And she was a little embarrassed and she just showed me her house. And that's how it started. We didn't even talk about what these houses used to look like, but in this particular house here, the children are in the team program, which I run. Some of the things we take for granted, I mean, they were used to walking in their house, you slam the door, everything shakes. One restroom for eight people in a two-bedroom home with only a bathtub and a commode. No sink. Kids washing their face and brushing their teeth in the kitchen sink. So 
you had four girls, two boys, and one one room with three bed bunks set. I mean, it's like third world living, you know. I'm just so happy for these kids because they deserve to live in a quality house and, and they deserve just to have proper running water and being able to flush the toilet properly. And I'm, I'm so happy that in their lifetime, they were able to live in a quality home. So we built the holding house, there's a sidewalk in front of it. I said, well, there'd never been a sidewalk on this street ever before. See, every house since then, there's no sidewalk. Well, why is that? Because those residents filled out a piece of paper, took it down to City Hall and said, I don't want one. They exempted themselves, which is the right of every property owner. That's empowerment. They did it, not us. And so every one of these houses, the design was approved by them. Not by us, by them. So, I mean, I think they've learned a lot. We've learned probably more from them. This is a street that's forgotten. In the history of Dallas, eventually would just go away. But yet we had five single family residences. People own their home that should have a direct say in the things that impact their life. And what I'm happy about is, you know, working with Jubilee Park and St. Michael's is there's a group of people that have that value set that says, whatever we do, if we're trying to help someone, they need to have a say in what we do. And that's working humbly. We've gotten to know the residents here, but I, I'm gonna say in the same way that Jubilee Park and St. Michael's has engaged, you become a part of a bigger family. Hey, baby in. Now, I'll never forget, there was a meeting at Jubilee and Miss Ella and several of the other folks that live here. And a lot of folks are related in a sort of one way or another, and a lot of last names of Garrett. And everybody's introducing themselves, and I happen to be at the end of the line. We're going around the room, and it was, you know, Miss Ella May Garrett and Pat and Ernest Garrett. And anyway, it got to me, and I just said Brent Garrett. And they all just fell out laughing. And, and Miss Ella was the first one to slap me on the back and say, that's right. So we're, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we know at some point we'll be done here, but we have no idea how we ever leave because it's a part of us, you know, and, and that relationship, so that's. And then with my kids, going through Jubilee, they learn a lot of things. They learn how to be diverse. They learn how that there were other cultures other than our own. They learn how to reach out to other people other than just always hoarding things for yourself. And so in going through uh, with Jubilee, you know, I think they really learned a lot about uh, themselves. It really could be seen as a bridge, and I would say it's even more than a bridge now. It's, it's, a, it's a real highway. I mean, there's a real connection now with people who are very familiar uh, from our congregation and their neighborhoods to the neighborhoods of Jubilee. Uh, there's probably less fear, there's less intimidation. Understanding is, is greater than it ever has been before. And sometimes just a spark takes a little bit of air and a little bit of faith in order for a fire to grow. The Jubilee is that spark in our community. And when you have communities that come and say that our crime rate has dropped anywhere from 27 to 33 percent, and it's because we have taken ownership of our community and it's a partnership through St. Michael and Jubilee, not something. And I'm not sure, but I think Jubilee has contributed to the extension of my life. It's a great, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a blessing. And, uh, and I, I can't say it anymore. I, it's not work. And I, I don't feel that Jubilee is a, a cross or a barrier or work. It's, it's something that I, I love doing. This is where you're really dealing on a daily basis with people, people with needs and hurts. And so to be a part of an organization that is committed to serving as a catalyst, to be servant leaders, has been an incredible experience. The Jubilee Park neighborhood has given us an avenue to deepen our faith, to realize the way that grace can come among us and then extend through our hands and heart and pocketbooks. But then in doing so, discovering that there's great treasures, there's great resources in a neighborhood beyond ours. It's not just dilapidated and poor. In the middle of poverty, we also find a wonderful people who are seeking a better life and coming alongside of them, we learn a whole, whole, whole lot about ourselves and how to become more humble, how to become servants, and how to um, roll up our sleeves, quite literally, 
and uh, extend um, our love. I convinced a, a doctor friend of mine that he should come out here. He was a widower at the time and had no grandchildren. And he came and these children had never known a doctor personally. And so they felt a kinship. Well, it got to the point after about three sessions that Maurice, he was looking more toward coming and doing the reading, or at least as much as the children were looking forward to seeing him. And when he would walk in the room, the children would just scramble to him and wrap their arms around his... <clears throat> that's, that's a tough one for me, because he's gone. Uh, they would wrap their arms around his legs and, and say, we love you, Dr. Adam. That's tough to beat. That's, that's the other side of the blessing we got.